Houston experience. I'm right next to the stock exchange. Oh, you're downtown. Okay. Yeah. But we work in, but I work in Brooklyn. Okay. Good. Yeah. I, I used to live down in Soho many, many moons ago. Many moons ago. <laughs> Life's a little bit different uptown. <laughs> Okay, welcome everybody. We are now live on YouTube and uh, we're also live for everybody that signed up for this individually. So I wanna thank you for joining us uh, this evening. If you'll just give me one more second, I just wanna make sure that we're all set here. Uh, good, I have way too many windows open on my end trying to control this, this thing here. Um, my name is Marie McGillicuddy. I'm the Vice President of Admissions. Feel free to take your camera and uh, take a picture of that QR code. It will bring you uh, to links for our Instagram, our YouTube, our blogs, all that good stuff so you get all that information. And if you have any questions after this, always feel free to reach out to us. So I will be your MC throughout the evening. It should last anywhere between an hour to an hour and a half, depending on how well and how, how vibrant the conversation goes, which usually it goes fantastic. Um, there is an area in your bar that will say Q&A. So at any point in time, you can go ahead and type your questions here. I also have my colleague, Mr. Ryan Ross, who's in the back end, who will be facilitating any questions that are coming in uh, via YouTube live stream. Uh, and if we're going to be answering them live, I'll just simply click the button that will say we will answer it live and you'll see that on your end. So just hang tight because we will be going through everything in this presentation. And I like to always start off by introducing our panelists. I'm gonna pull up their slides and if the panelists, once your slide comes up, go ahead, just talk a little bit about yourself, tell everybody where you're from, what you're currently doing and all that good stuff. So without further ado, I would actually like to start with Dr. Edith Esparza, Dr. Esparza. Oh, hello, <clears throat> good evening. Um, my name is uh, Edith Esparza Young, and I am an associate professor here in beautiful St. Kitts. Uh, I help students with um, time management, study skills, professional communication, and I'm originally from Texas, so howdy if anybody out there is from Texas, uh, and also from Mexico. So yeah, that's me. Excellent. Great. Thank you for joining this evening. And we have another faculty member with us here, Dr. Katanj, if you can go ahead, introduce yourself, who you are, where you're from, all that good stuff, we want you to do. Okay, hi, I'm Doug Kotanj. I'm originally from uh, Amherst, Massachusetts. Spent 30 years in Boston teaching in medical schools there and doing research, and then moved to Chicago for about six years and then got tired of the cold weather and moved down here to St. Kitts where I'm the, currently the course director for Gross Anatomy, and I also teach in the neuroscience course and having a wonderful time with the students here in St. Kitts. Excellent, thank you. Very important question, are you a Red Sox fan? Oh yeah. <laughs> awesome. I'm from Boston yeah. originally, so. Okay, okay, hold on, I, I'm from New York. Uh oh, uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh what did I start? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. We also have two wonderful alumni with us tonight, as well as current students. So I want to throw it over to Dr. Zhang. Go ahead, introduce yourself, where you're from, all that good stuff, and what you're doing now in New York City. Yeah, hey, everyone. Um, so my name is Billy Zhang. I'm one of the uh, alumni of UMHS, graduated back in 2018, which feels like a long time ago, um, but originally from New Jersey and just kind of took my education further south to Georgia, where I went to Emory and then further south to St. Kitts and then brought it all the way back up to the Tri-State. So currently I'm an Associate Clinical Professor of Medicine with NYU, and I recently uh, was promoted to Associate Program Director for the Internal Medicine Residency. And so part of my job is training residents, teaching them the foundations of assessment and planning, um, and then working closely with our medical students as well, in addition to preparing kind of for the next groups of uh, residents. Um, so uh, very interesting career path as mine's taken, but kind of foundation really comes from, uh, from UMHS. Um, so excited for the you know, uh, rest of the session tonight. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. And over in beautiful Michigan, we have Dr. Workus. Dr. Workus. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Holly. Uh, I'm originally born and raised in Michigan. Um, I went to Albion College here in Michigan, and I graduated from UMHS in 2018, 
actually it's 2017. Um, so I actually knew Billy down on the island and he did not tell anyone yet, but he reviewed my resume and he reviews UMHS student CVs, which is really helpful. Um, and it keeps us all connected. Um, so I did my internal medicine residency in Chicago, and then I did a palliative care fellowship, a palliative care and hospice at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm currently just practicing palliative care. I'm an attending physician back in my hometown of Grove Point. Excellent. And both Dr. Zhang and Dr. Workus uh, also interview candidates for UMHS. So you might be one of the lucky ones who get to have an interview with either Dr. Zhang or Dr. Workus. Uh, and I'm very pleased to introduce Corinne, who is currently down in St. Kitts. So Corinne, if you can come on, tell us who you are, where you're from, current semester, all that good stuff. Hello, my name is Corinne. Um, I'm from Troy, Missouri. <laughs> uh, I did my undergrad in St. Louis University and um, I'm uh, on my fifth semester here on the island. So my last one on the island. <laughs> uh, and then I'll go to Maine for next semester. Um, and then I'm also a anatomy TA here and also the president of American Medical Student Association just a little bit about myself. <laughs> Fantastic. Let me see if Ali, Ali hasn't joined us yet, but when he does, I'll have him introduce himself. Um, before I turn it over to President Ross, I just want to walk through what you're going to see tonight and what we're going to talk about tonight. Of course, we're going to talk about UMHS, the program overview, our faculty members, what's it like in St. Kitts, clinicals, residency, and admissions. And I'll hop around on slides uh, when President Ross speaks because we do cover everything from A through Z. So our panelists, you can go ahead and turn your, your cameras off. President Ross, I'd like to formally introduce you and turn it over uh, to you. And feel free to bring in any, any one of us throughout this presentation. Thank you so much. Good, you ready for me? Absolutely, take it away. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad to be on this, uh, this webinar. It's, it's great to be able to uh, speak directly to prospective students and share with you some of my experiences uh, uh, in terms of you know, where we're at, what, where we came from, what our goals are, what are our objectives, what makes us uniquely different from other institutions. And it gives me a, a chance to kind of brag about the things that we've done, and I'm, I'm excited to share that all with you. Uh, I like to make this as interactive as possible. So as I go through the presentation, which I hope to cover a lot of material, um, feel free to you know ask questions, and, and we, we will get to them. And I'll, I'll try to be res as responsive as, as possible. But uh, once again, this gives me a, a, an opportunity to share with you a little bit about UMHS, and, and I hope that uh, I answer all of the, your questions by the end of this uh, presentation. So let me start off about a little bit about myself in the history, the, uh, my history. So way back uh, in the late 70s, my dad and I established one of the first offshore medical schools called Ross University. Um, and at that time, it was a small school, uh, no recognition, um, and, and the, we were actually in rented facilities uh, until we were able to have enough funding to be able to pull the, put the program together. But over the years, we kept reinvesting in the institution. We obtained multiple affiliations with hospitals throughout the United States. We had recognition from the US Department of Education. Um, and we built up our facilities to what I consider one of the, the nicest facilities at that time. Uh, and and uh, we had thousands of graduates who are now licensed and practicing throughout the United States. And the reason I'm telling you this is, is that uh, I wanted to share with you my experiences in developing offshore schools, and it it was a, uh, you know, it was a learning experience. But what happened was, what when my dad reached his late eighties, uh, he decided that it was time to you know retire, so he sold Ross University, um, and but he you know continued to watch what was going on in the Caribbean, and he didn't particularly like what he saw. What, what was going on. And we had a number of 
uh, uh, organizations that decided to start buying up the Caribbean schools, and it became more of a business than an, an, than an academic center. And these schools started to bring, you know, accept as many as 300, 400, 500 students a semester, two to three times a, a year. Um, and it, in, in our view, it was really hard to provide a quality academic program with the, that number of students. So my dad turned to me and said, you know, it's it, we, we, we we're, we're going to get back. We're going to get back into uh, academic medicine, but this time will be a little different. So, in, you know, when we first started, you know, Ross, it took, you know, 20 plus years to build up our reputation, build up our facilities, uh, get the recognition from the various accreditors and states and uh, U.S. Department of Education. But this time we had the resources, we had the funding, we had the experience, we had the knowledge, we knew all about the various accreditations, how to get them, how to get the various approvals. Uh, so we really... Out of the gate, we were able to, you know, jumpstart the institution. So, so, uh, you know, in in terms of just the facilities, um, I my dad turned to me and said, you know, at this time around, uh, you have an unlimited budget. You can do whatever you want to do, but make sure it's on par with U.S. medical schools. So I know, you know, basically what was going on in the Caribbean. I know what I did at my former institution, and I and I been to many of the other institutions around the Caribbean. And, and this time around, with an unlimited budget, I was able to develop what I consider one of the premier institutions in, in the United States. And we didn't spare any funds in terms of our facilities. Uh, totally state of the art. Um, from the fiber optic backbones to the new Fortinet network we just recently put in. We were originally using Cisco, but we just replaced that with the more most state-of-the-art Fortinet uh, network. Uh, the, we have significant bandwidth down there, all the classrooms, the entire campus uh, is Wi-Fi, has Wi-Fi. So wherever you sit on campus, you have full access to not only the internet, to the network, to our learning resource center, to our library database, to our international databases. So, so you, so you know that anywhere you, you could be sitting out under a tent eating your lunch, or you could be in the library or any of the classrooms, the laboratories. You have access to you know a blindingly fast uh, and robust network. Um, all the classrooms are, are designed so they include the most state-of-the-art uh, audio-visual equipment. So if you see some of the pictures up there now, you can see we use high-resolution monitors uh, throughout the classrooms. They're connected to uh, not only the network, but also computers for PowerPoint presentations. Uh, also, act, they are able to access the learning management system. And all students, if you can see the students uh, in the top picture on the left, they have their computers on. So, so they're accessing the same PowerPoint presentation through our learning management system, and they're able to annotate, annotate the lecture. So they bring those home at, at night and, and, and are able to continue to review what it was presented during the day. So once again, all, all the classrooms are completely state-of-the-art with the, the most current uh, and up-to-date equipment. And, and uh, I am constantly updating uh, our, our, uh, our equipment, whether it be computers, uh, whether it's network equipment, whether it's access points, whether it's, uh, for example, recently I replaced all the monitors in the, in the library with brand new 55 inch monitors. Uh, in, in the last year, I replaced all the monitors in the auditorium. So, so we never sit on our laurels. We're always looking for ways to update and improve, uh, our, our uh, our, our campus. So state-of-the-art campus, uh, modern library, learning resource center, you, uh, all our labs are state-of-the-art. I, I, I love our skills lab. It, uh, it, it was designed to be a, a virtual hospital uh, where you have uh, at least 28 beds uh, with uh, a variety of simulators, some so high, high res, uh, some of the simulators are high, high resolution, high def uh, simulators, such as SimMan um, and 
um, Harvey, and we, we'll talk a little bit about that. For example, Har Harvey simulates virtually every cardiac sound you can imagine. So in the old days, you, you'd ha you know you would have a patient who would be there, or you would have a recording that you know, and you would have to listen to the sounds to uh, understand what what that might might sound like, what a, what a cardiac issue might sound like. Now we can program Harvey to simulate virtually every sound and what we use is electronic stethoscopes. So you, you put these stethoscopes on uh, and you could put 10 people around the Harvey, you can simu simulate any sound that you want and then you have to diagnose uh, what that particular sound is. So it, it's a great learning tool. And we use, you know, once again, SimMan, MediMan um, and, uh, and uh, we also work in our simulation lab amongst our students. We bring in professional patients, and you mostly utilize that during uh, ICM, which is in your fifth semester. Uh, but you also might utilize it in physical diagnosis in your first semester. And what I like about the program, the curriculum, we'll get into curriculum a little bit later, but we introduce clinical material throughout the basic science program, starting in your first semester and culminating in your fifth semester. And then when you, after you finish your fifth semester in St. Kitts, you move on to the main semester where, where you have uh, ICM-2. So you have ICM-1, which starts the foundation uh, of your clinical skills, uh, but it, it's we finish up in ICM-2 where you're working uh, with approximately 40, 50 preceptors uh, in Maine, fine tuning your clinical skills, working in simulation labs, uh, but also giving you an opportunity to go out into the field at uh, a number of our affiliated clinics and hospitals. Uh, so you're getting a lot of hands-on experience before you jump into the clinical program because we want you to seamlessly transition to the clinical program. So, so, so in terms of our program, one of the, one of the reasons why we established Ross University, uh, I, I mean University of Medicine and Health Sciences, was because we didn't like what we saw going on and we didn't think it was personalized and and so we wanted to create an environment different from what the other institutions were offering so we we purposely maintain a small student faculty ratio we have approximately uh, a, a six to one uh, student to faculty ratio um actually eight to eight to one student faculty ratio uh which which is on par with what you would expect if you attended the u.s medical school that's the benefit of this institution it's a personalized approach where you get to know the faculty the faculty get to know you you're just not a number you know I, i've been to institutions like university of maryland where where there's 400 500 students in a class you never really get to know the faculty member you never get to meet the faculty member you're a number you're a social security number here you get to know every one of your faculty members and one of the things that that makes us special is the caliber and the quality of the faculty that we recruit so how do we recruit our faculty well first of all they have to be appropriately correct credentials they have to have either an md or md phd um, and they have to have significant teaching experience but what what makes us different is that every faculty member that we consider has to come down and give a lecture to the students and the students actually rate and rank them uh, and we also have peer review from our own internal fac faculty. So we do not hire any faculty without the blessing of our student body. So you're, you know that the people that are coming in are, are, are of high quality. But what I like most of, about, our, about, about our faculty is their dedication. They love to teach and they're there primarily for one reason is to ensure your success. So, so we got really, we have really good faculty that are dedicated to your success. And I think as a result of the caliber and the quality of the faculty and the caliber of the, of the students coming in, we have probably the lowest attrition rate of any medical school uh, in the Caribbean. So, you know, if you go to some of these larger institutions, you know, what I've understand, you can see attrition rate as high as 30, 40%. Um, we are we have an attrition rate as low as four percent which is exceptional you, you remember when you were in organic chemistry and your professor looked at you and he said look to your left look to your right you're not going to see that person next year i can honestly say you look to your left look to your right you'll see that person at graduation that's how good we are in terms of the of, of the, the caliber of the academic program the quality of the faculty the, the resources the facilities that we have 
we're also going to talk a little bit about you know counseling and and uh, and the faculty's responsibilities. Uh, part part of what we have at, at UMHS is that that we monitor our students' progress through the academic program. If we see that you're struggling, we um, after each block examination, we will call. Well, the faculty member will call you in to meet with you to develop an action plan and to to address any. Uh, deficiencies that you may have, and they will then refer you to our learning, uh, our skill learning skills um, individual. Um, and Edith will be talking a little bit about that, and and uh, our learning specialist who can who can provide you with you know more details about what they're doing. But the goal, the goal, our objective is to you know ensure your success academically. So it's it's so when you join an institution like this, you go through the academic program. If you have deficiencies, you meet with the faculty. Even if you don't have deficiencies, I always urge students to meet with their faculty early on. Don't wait for the first block examination. Meet with them early on, address any concerns or questions you may have, and, and then you progress from there. But to me, it's all about the support services an institution is able to provide. And when you have a small school, we cater to the individual needs of the students. So we have counseling. Uh, we, we have... Uh, faculty that are mentoring, we have students that are mentoring, all those things really add up and help you through the academic program. So traditional basic science program, you can either uh, complete it in four or five semesters. Um, we, what, what I like is the EBS program, I would say 80%, 85% of our students are in that program, it allows them to complete the basic science in fifth, five semesters, it allows them to reduce their course load, and one of the things that we see is there's a correlation between performance in the basic sciences and how you perform on your licensing examination, so the better you do in the basic sciences, the better you do on your licensing examination, so if you can reduce your course load, it gives you a better opportunity to perform uh, well, when it comes to USMLE. So traditional basic science program in St. Kitts. Uh, once again, you can complete it in four or five semesters. Uh, and after you complete the basic science program, you then transition into our fifth semester in Maine, uh, where, where once again, you complete introduction to clinical medicine two. Um, what I like about ICM2 is the number of MDs that are working directly with you to mentor you, tutor you, work with your skills, uh, and, and enhance uh, your clinical knowledge. And, and, our, and one of the things that you'll hear from our students is because of that program, you really do seamlessly transition to the clinical program where you're in, in, in the same environment as students from U.S. medical schools and competing at that same level in terms of knowledge and skills. So I, I really like that program. But one of the things that that um, is special about uh, us is that we're probably the only Caribbean medical school, maybe the only medical school that has a full semester uh, U, uh, USMLE review program. So when you get into the fifth semester, uh, we've affiliated with Kaplan Medical um, and we've developed a special review program bringing in faculty top faculty from U.S. medical schools that are part of the Kaplan program. We cover all the essentials that are necessary for you to perform well. We give you a variety of di diagnostic and final examinations to ensure that you have the knowledge uh, to succeed and pass USMLE on, on the first attempt. But what I, I like is that from day one, from the day you start, uh, UMHS, we provide you with all those resources. So in, in addition to, you know, Kaplan, um, we, we also are affiliated with AMBOSS, which is also another premier review program. So day one, you have access to the, a substantial uh, uh, database of questions from AMBOSS and Kaplan, and we urge students to you know, continue to use that all the way through the basic sciences. You have a, a substantial video series, uh, lecture series uh, that's online from Kaplan. You have uh, didactic lectures from AMBOSS, um, and between the two of them, you have all the resources that you, you need to prepare yourself. And if you could kickstart and get into that from first semester on, it's gonna be better prepare you for USMLE once you complete the fifth semester 
Um, so I'm really happy about that. The other thing that we 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 utilize the MBME shelf examination. So the National Board of Medical Examiners (MBME) uh, is the group that actually established the United States Licensing Examination (USMLE), and they've created what they call shelf examinations, which are utilized by most U.S. medical schools as final examinations in the basic science program and clinical science program. And we utilize the shelf examinations both in the basic and clinical science program. What's nice about this is that, that the after you sit for the examination, you are able to uh, get back from MBME a, a diagnostic review uh, of the examination, which shows how you compare to students in US medical schools. It will show your strengths and it will also show your, your, your weaknesses. And it allows you to, you know, continue to review to build up your knowledge in those areas that you were a little bit weak in. So uh, we 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 and these questions that they use in the shelf are comparable uh, to USMLE style questions, both in, in format and in style. So the more you have access to those type of questions, the better it prepares you for U USMLE. So curriculum comparable to U.S. schools, small school environment. Uh, great faculty, outstanding facilities, utilization of AMBOS and Kaplan, all really to help prepare you. And it, to me, it's all about performance and outcomes. We want you to pass on the first attempt your USMLE, both step one and step two. You, After you complete step one, you enter into the clinical program. We're affiliated with over 20 teaching hospitals throughout the United States, Canada, uh, and Puerto Rico. Uh, we are currently uh, have affiliations um, in New York, uh, and this is the listing, uh, in California, Canada, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Maryland, Michigan, uh, and, and the list goes on. Uh, we're always trying to add more hospitals to our program. Uh, we're, we're trying to add more hospitals in Florida as well as California um, and, and in Canada. So we're and right now we're affiliated with Ponce School of Medicine. Ponce School of Medicine is a uh, uh, a double AMC uh, U.S. medical school, accredited U.S. accredited U.S. medical school, um, and uh, we're affiliated with them. And they offer our students both core and elective rotations. Core rotations are what you you take in your uh, junior year. Um, it, it's where you have to go to one of our affiliated hospitals, uh, where, and uh, th that's where you'll take uh, surgery, OBGYN, pediatrics, internal medicine, family medicine, psychiatry. Um, and and uh, after you complete 48 weeks of core, then you're allowed to do uh, uh, 30 weeks of elective generally in your senior year, uh, and you have the option to go to our affiliated hospitals or any teaching hospital throughout the United States, as long as you get approval from the dean, the clinical dean. What I like about that opportunity, which is different from many of the other schools, is that this gives you an opportunity to, to showcase, to show so residency directors how good you are. If you if you if, if you know that it, you know resin, in terms of residency programs. Um, in the United States, they they typically get thousands and thousands of applications from uh, students, both in the United States and international, and many of them are sight unseen. But if you are at, at, able to actually go to that hospital, work with the residency director, they can see directly how you perform your knowledge base, um, and it, it gives you really a leg up over uh, all those who have never been to the institution. So. Uh, you know, we, we can talk about that. Holly can talk a little bit about that. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, so, so that's, that's the benefit of doing your, your electives. We're approved, uh, in multiple States right now. We're currently approved in, uh, New, New York, uh, we're approved in Florida, California, um, Georgia, um, and we are seeking approval currently in the state of New York. Um, so, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So that, that's just kind of a little overview of the program. I'm going to be joining you more, uh, as we go through the program to, you know, go more into detail about some of the things that we've talked about, but, uh, I'm going to let some other people talk now and then, uh, I'll jump in later on. Unless there's any questions. <laughs> okay. 
Great. Thanks. Thanks, President Ross. Um, what I'll do here is I, I did uh, put in the Q&A that we're going to answer some things live uh, because this will actually go right into what we're what we're talking about. But just to kind of backtrack. So medical school is traditionally about four years. It might take some students uh, a little bit more than four years. Um, there's two parts to medical school. You have the basic sciences program and the clinical sciences program. The basic sciences program is the standard med program is four semesters. Okay. We have another entry point where it could be extended basic sciences where you take the four semesters and you extend it into five semesters. Okay. We also have another entry program called the accelerated review program. That's one semester before the medical school starts. And the primary purpose of this program is to bring you right to the level that you need to be uh, in order to be successful in medical school. So let's say your MCAT score or your GPA wasn't the greatest in the world. Uh, you might be placed in the accelerated review program, and that's really just to bring you up to here where you need to be uh, to start basic sciences successfully. So I know it's a little confusing. We have something called the fifth semester, um, and then, you know, extended basic sciences has a fifth semester. So just to recap a little bit, basic sciences, the standard med program is four semesters. Uh, if you're accepted into the standard med program, you'll be done in four semesters and then you'll move to Portland, Maine to start the fifth semester there. Or if you decide to opt for the extended basic sciences program or you're placed in the extended basic sciences program, that's going to take those four semesters and extend them out to five semesters. And we actually have uh, 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 Corinne, who's a, who's a current student here, um, if you don't mind coming on and talking a little bit about your experience for extended basic sciences. Marie, before she does that, I just want to answer a couple of really quick questions. So question one is, are, are block exams written by professors? Yes, but we also have MBME examinations. So we both have a combination of shelf examinations and block, and all, I'm sorry, all block examinations are written by professors. You have three block examinations and then your final examination. So all blocks are written by the faculty. Then the final examination is either, either is an MBME or one that's written by the faculty. Each semester is 15 months long. Uh, is there an exam at the end of the program that students need to pass it for you? Yes. So at the end of the fifth semester, uh, you have to sit for a comprehensive examination comparable to you uh, to to the uh, USMLE. You have to pass that examination in order to to continue on and, and sit for the examination. But in addition to that, we've also uh, after two months after you complete the fifth semester, because there's a usually when you sit for USMLE, you sign up for a window, and, and the first window usually takes about three months after you've finished the fifth semester. So two months after you finish the fifth semester, we also give students an opportunity to sit for the uh, MBME comprehensive. It's another examination. It, it's, it doesn't affect whether you can sit for, the exam for USMLE or not, but it also gauges how much knowledge that you have. And it will show you how you compare uh, to other students in the United States and, and, and just to make sure that you're, you're, you're ultimately prepared for the examination. Uh, uh, questions about tuition images. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, Marie, we're going to go uh, back to this. Um, let's let's move on to the next person, and then I'll answer some of these other questions. Okay, yeah, I think the the questions that were just asked there um, have to do with clinical rotations, but let's first talk about the basic sciences, and then we'll move into the clinical sciences um, once we get to that, that section of the presentation. So Corinne, if you don't mind coming on and just talking a little bit about your experience in the extended basic sciences, um, you know, because one of the questions that we get from students is, okay, I want the standard med program. I want to be done in four semesters. Just talk about your experience and, and the, maybe the importance to you of extended basic sciences. Uh, yes, sure. Um, so actually I started in ARP, the accelerated review program. And um, for me, I'll just say my experience for that as well. Um, I've been out of school before this, like for about four years. And so um, the accelerated review program 
really helped me um, get back into that routine of going to school and stuff and studying. And also um, there's perks to the accelerated review program where um, actually Dr. Esparza, I'm sure she'll talk about it, is that you get to learn study skills that you definitely need in medical school, especially if you didn't have any in undergrad. Um, but uh, at the end of ARP, I did have the option to either go the traditional med route or the extended um, basic sciences. And for me, I chose the extended basic sciences because I just needed, you know, the time. And um, for the med um, traditional route, you it it really all depends on what your needs are. So for me, I saw I got more time and also I wanted to be able to do extracurricular activities because right now, like I said, I am the president of the uh, of the American Medical uh, Student Association here. And for me, I knew that if I was in the traditional med program, I would not be able to do that. <laughs> so it, it all depends on what your needs are. And I could tell you, you know, a million reasons why I did it, but you need to realize, you know, what your needs are for it, if that makes sense. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> um, Dr. Sparzer, if you can come on and, and talk a little bit about the Accelerator Review Program as well. And, and you know, Corinne, you pointed out perfectly, you know, it's, it, it's a strong program, especially if you've been out of school, for a few years, you've got to get back into the swing of things. And it's not an easy thing to do if you've been out of school for even, even a year or, or two plus years. But uh, Dr. Esparza, if you can give us some more insight on the Accelerator Review Program, that would be great. Sure. Um, so uh, in addition to the services that we provide for all students, specifically for the Accelerated Review Program, uh, during the very first week, uh, we meet with students every single day as part of the schedule. And for those uh, five consecutive days, we make sure that students, um, as Corinne mentioned, you know, they come with a strong academic background, but medical school in and of itself requires a, a different set of skills. Uh, you need to be able to uh, use research-based strategies that help you with long-term uh, memory, uh, space repetition, time management, organizational skills. So we really make sure that students have access to those uh, skills right away as soon as uh, classes start. Uh, we try to uh, immediately support students by providing them uh, with an opportunity to have a mentor. And we also uh, make sure that we cover vital test-taking strategies, which are very, again, unique to uh, medical school type questions that they're gonna be looking at later on for their NBMEs or for step one. So in essence, you could say that what we want you to do is to be ready from day one. Um, and that's part of the environment uh, that we create for our students. We want them to feel like um, they are getting a tailored customized, customized experience uh, because we, in addition to meeting with them in class, they're able to meet with uh, learning specialists one-on-one. -on -one. And so that allows each of us to be able to work with students based on their starting point so that they can go ahead and reach uh, their academic goals. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And just to, uh, to reiterate the length of the program, we're on a trimester system. So the semester works like this. Uh, you have three start dates per year, January, May, and September. So January to April, May to August, and September to December. You have about two to three weeks off in between uh, semesters to kind of you know go rejuvenate and come back and uh, 
and start back again. Here is a, a bit of a, if you wanna take a screenshot of this, just kind of gives you a timeline of your entire journey, whether you come in for the accelerated review program or the standard med or the extended basic sciences, then you move to the fifth semester. You take step one, you do have to take the Kaplan exit exam in order to be qualified to sit for step one. There is a minimum uh, score that you have to achieve. I don't know that off the top of my head, but you do have to achieve a minimum passing score before we certify you to take step one. Once you pass step one, then you're gonna move on to your core rotations. And we'll show you that list again in, in just a few moments. After you complete your core rotations, you're gonna do step two and the occupational English test. Okay, and then you're gonna move on to your elective rotations. And then you're gonna go into the residency match program, graduate, and then you're gonna start residency. But keep this in mind that this is not a race at all. You know, some students will, will call in with the mindset, I wanna be done in exactly four years. Sometimes it might take you four and a half years or it might take you five years, depending on the entry point and depending on how many months it took you to, to, to maybe study a little bit more for, for step one. So it's a marathon. That's a, a very famous quote that goes around about medical school. A lot of medical education professionals say it's not a race. It is a marathon and it's not about just getting to the finish line. It's about retaining the information and getting the highest scores possible. So keep that in the back of your mind. Um, President Ross already touched on our faculty. They all hold terminal degrees within their fields and they absolutely love what they do. And you can see that just by their passion when they're in front of you teaching you uh, with the live lectures. We have no online classes anymore. Everything uh, is in person. Okay. The next question you have before we move on to talking about anatomy, because that's something we really want to uh, get into as well. So St. Kitts here, I'm just going to press the little play button here. Just follow my little dragging of this map. Here's the United States. And you just come on down and, and you uh, go over, you'll see Puerto Rico. And then we are off just a little bit to the east of Puerto Rico on the small island of St. Kitts. Uh, it's a teeny tiny island. English is the major language. There's direct flights from Miami, New York City, Toronto. Uh, if you can't get a direct flight, mostly everybody will come into Miami and come on down. Um, I'm a New Yorker now, even though I'm a Red Sox fan. And if I get in a car, I can drive around that uh, drumstick looking island there in about 45 minutes uh, if there's no cows crossing the street. Beautiful island, uh, definitely. Uh, indeed. And if you want to take a virtual tour, I would definitely encourage you to do so. You can just hop on our website at any point or take a screenshot of this. And you can actually walk right into the classrooms and uh, you can walk right through anatomy. You can see it uh, happening live, you know, those 360 live videos. And wherever you see, let me get my cursor up here if you can see it, wherever you see a play button on the virtual tour, make sure that you click it because that will bring you right into the building and it will bring you to a guide who will walk you through uh, the campus. And President Ross and his family have done a phenomenal job of building a school that really meets the needs of modern medicine and for our students. And at the end of the day, you wanna, you wanna learn what the greatest tools out there. Um, we talked a little bit about the classrooms here. Uh, everywhere you go on campus, you'll be able to power up. The Wi-Fi is, is strong. Everything that you need is on campus for you. Um, our prized section of the campus is our anatomy building. And President Ross, do you wanna, do you wanna jump back on and, and talk a little bit about the, the, the thinking behind putting the anatomy lab together? And maybe we'll bring in Dr. Katanch a little bit as well. Sure, so yeah, Doug, uh, you, you could probably help me out a little bit on this one, but uh, so, you, you know, I, I've i developed uh, uh, several uh, anatomy labs in the past, and uh, I've learned uh, a lot from my mistakes. But this one is really kind of state of the art. You know, we, we put high resolution monitors around each of the cadaver workstations so that 
we 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 could uh, and with a high def camera we could focus in on a prosector cadaver and show you what you need to be focusing on as you do your dissection we also have trays that pull down from each one of those poles that you see in this picture so that you can have access to a, a large anatomical database uh we're we're different than many of the other schools that have gone to plasmatization uh and models and we have actual cadavers uh, and we maintain a six to one cadaver ratio. And the opportunity to dissect is just absolutely phenomenal, especially for those people who are thinking about going into surgery to be able to dissect is, is really something very special. So um, I, I consider it as probably one of the finest in the Caribbean. And, you know, and, and Doug came out of, uh, you know, U.S. medical school. So maybe it is a good opportunity for, for Doug who uh, to Dr. Katanch to talk a little bit about the anatomy lab and, you know, his feelings about it. Thank you, Warren. Yes, um, I spent 40 years teaching anatomy to medical students uh, in the Boston area, in the Chicago area, and finally got tired of winters and came down here. But this is one of the nicest anatomy labs I've actually taught in, in a long time. It's, it's, it's beautifully set up. Uh, we have uh, wonderful equipment for the students. The students do the dissecting. We also have prosections done by some of the faculty and staff. But the students are the ones doing the dissection and learning from the dissection. And um, what, I, what I find amazing about UMHS is the students are incredibly enthusiastic about learning anatomy and being in the lab. And, and they're just really overjoyed to get the experience uh, to do this. And, and I, I've taught in medical schools with cadavers mostly, but then during COVID, we had to go online. And I really learned that so much of the teaching is done in the lab over the cadaver in a one-to-one -one ratio with the faculty. But that's where we really teach you why the, the anatomy you're learning is relevant. Um, one of the things I've always believed in is that uh, I try to teach anatomy that's important for you as a physician. I'm not trying to make you into an anatomist. I need to teach you why anatomy is important for you as a physician so that you can, uh, you can understand your patients when they walk into your office and they describe things, you will know what relationship that has to the anatomy and be able to know where to go to figure out what's going on. But it's been a joy teaching here. I, I love the, the faculty and I love the students. Um, and then we have TAs, upper class TAs who are really enthusiastic and are there a lot of the time in the lab to help you guys learn and to tell you what you need to do to survive in, in the course. Great, thank you so much, I appreciate that. And um, actually, Dr. Dr. Zhang, would you mind coming on and just talking a little bit about, about your experience on, on campus in the anatomy lab? Yeah, I think the anatomy lab has probably undergone a lot of uh, upgrades since I was there a few years ago. But even at that point, it was still you know, uh, a very impressive facility because since that time, I've seen anatomy labs in multiple other medical schools. And I can you know, really put our facilities pretty much at the top with everything from the ventilation to having new cadavers each time and really allowing the students to have that opportunity to do that first dissection with their first uh, you know, um, patient experience. Um, I think it's a really humbling opportunity for students to be able to have this experience because um, a lot of programs are moving away to electronic pro or pro section. So I think it's a really important tradition that we're still maintaining. Um, and I think students hopefully in every subsequent semester are really benefiting from that too. Um, I think having the quality of faculty and the number of faculty with the teaching assistants um, is a really great environment that it builds. It's a very kind of academic environment. There's a lot of inquiry and question, and there's no, um, there's no concern that, you know, there's no such thing as a dumb question in the anatomy lab because we're all just really in there for the same purpose to learn. Um, and I think a lot for me, having been an anatomy TA also was kind of the start of my interest in teaching to begin with, plus with all the faculty that taught me um, it's kind of the start of my interest in teaching. So really, uh, medical students really get so many more um, things out of just learning the anatomy, preparing for a board exam, but also thinking about themselves in their future careers too. So I mean, I think it was very multifaceted. I really enjoyed the anatomy lab um, and it really did a lot for me. And uh, I think with all the recent changes, it's just continuing to really flourish um, and really create this great experience uh, in, that very, in that one semester. Great. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Zane. Appreciate that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about equipping you with the tools to retain the information and, and be successful at the end of the day. Uh, along with the Anatomy Lab, we have a fantastic library and a learning support research center. We already spoke about the wireless capability on campus and we keep, we keep bringing that up because it's important, you're connected. This is a completely different world that we live in. Uh, everything uh, to um, your journals, medical journals, your access to AMBOSS, your access to MBME, your access to Kaplan, you'll be able to pull it up without any lag time. And that's, that's very important because you don't want to have to have any nuances when you're sitting down studying at the end of the day. So we want to make sure that, that you have uh, everything that you need. Um, and Dr. Esparza, if you don't mind coming back on again and actually talking maybe a little bit about those. Yeah, one, one, one thing I want to add about that last uh, picture that you, you have put up, mm -hmm. um, you know, in addition to, you know, having these various uh, software packages, we also recently acquired up to date, which our students utilize in the clinical program, but uh, all our students have access to up to date, um, which, which is a really nice software package you, you utilize in, in the clinical program and most residents uh, in the United States have full access to up-to-date and all our students have that too. But in, in terms of our library, not, not only do you have full access to all our journals and period, periodicals, but we also are affiliated with all these online databases. Um, so, so it is a very robust library. And, and once again, we go through reviews of our creditors. Eight, we're accredited by ACCM, which is recognized by the U.S. Department of Education through NCFMEA. So, so they very diligently will go through every aspect of the basic and clinical science program, in, including the library and the learning resource center. And they really feel it's on par with uh, what you would expect if you attend a U.S. school. The other part of, of ACCM, not only do they review our basic science program, but they are required to go to every one of our clinical teaching hospitals uh, and do site visits where they meet with the director of medical education uh, and meet with students and meet with preceptors. And every one of our affiliated hospitals has received an approval from our accreditor, which is recognized by the U.S. Department of Education. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, and, you know, uh, speaking of connectivity, I'll actually answer one of the questions get, that came in. Um, we do not expect any student to create a Facebook account or an Instagram account. Um, you know, the generation now, everybody has Instagram, everybody has, well, not everybody has Facebook, maybe my generation has Facebook, um, but Instagram is, is, is the new norm. But actually what we tell students during the first week of orientation is that the majority of you will be uh, blocking or, or, or shutting off your social media channels um, just to focus. Um, so there's there's no expectation on our, our end as administrators or faculty members that anybody should open up a Facebook or Instagram account. So I hope that uh, I answered that there. And I actually, I see Ali has joined us. So Ali, if you don't mind uh, turning your, your camera back on and if you can introduce yourself, who you are, um, what your what current semester you are, where you're from, and just tell us a little bit about your experience thus far. That would be great. Hi, Mary. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry for having a little trouble getting connected. Um, had a little class that I had to finish and I had a time mix, but I'm glad I'm here. Yes, so guys, hi, uh, my name is Ali. I am uh, EBS4, so second year of medical school. And I am from Chicago, uh, originally I'm Persian. And um, I joined UMHS in 2021, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm graduating in 2025. And um, honestly, you know, no one is making me to be here, but I am glad to be here to speak about how um, appreciating I am about uh, the experience that I have in medical school uh, at UMHS and how glad I am to meet the people that I met in the beginning uh, in my journey and I'm looking forward to meet. And that's just because my experience has been very um, special in a way that I have done a lot of research to get to medical school, uh, being an entrepreneur before coming back to school after my college, I worked for five, six years. And then when I decided that I wanted to come to medical school, um, 
I had my doubts, I had my uh, questions, and it w- like it was really meaningful for me to become uh, who I really wanted to become. So I really had to do a lot of research in order to get to a good school in my standards, and my standards tend out to be very good compared to the other people. Um, so I have done a lot of research on the Caribbean Medical School. I have had great people giving me advices about the situation on the Caribbean Medical School, the, 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 the way how, you know, what's the process to get into it, what's the process to get out of it. And um, I just, what I love about UMH is one of the only things that I tell everyone is that um, the experience that you get to have at UMHS, it's very unique in a way that you feel like you're in a, um, a concierge medical school. And when I say that concierge medical school, it's not in a way that they are pampering you and they're giving you everything to become a doctor. No, everyone needs to try, everyone needs to really study hard. But as when I say concierge, it's in a way that everything is provided. If someone who wants to be great in what they have dreamed about for all of their lives, they need to have the resources. They need to have the people that helps them to get there, especially in my situation after a few years of getting back to school. And I could have not asked for more. If someone is actually wanting and um, essentially having that mentality of becoming a great doctor, learning from the best, experiencing from the best. Um, and, you know, I just words can't explain much. I think UMHS can be really helpful for them. And um, Mary, if you have any question, I am more than happy. I see that you're back. So I am more than happy to answer. Great, thank you. We'll be going back and forth for throughout this. Thank you. Sure, um, no problem. Doc, thank you. Dr. Esparzer, if you don't mind coming on um, and talking a little bit about the mentoring program and our student services support that we have here and that we offer students. Uh, yes, this is a, an incredible program that UMHS has. It is uh, run by our students. Uh, each semester, it continues to grow. Uh, our leaders, we have five uh, student leaders who basically run the program. And it is um, peer-to-peer mentoring. It includes mentoring from one student who is being mentored by a student who is in an advanced semester. Uh, usually, we like to pair students who are just one semester ahead so that the experience um, is a little bit more relevant. Uh, This semester, we had over 100 participants uh, and that number stays very, very high. Uh, One of the best things about this program is, uh, well, I'll try to mention two, keep it to two because there's so many great things about it. But one of the most wonderful aspects of this program is that it provides a safety net. It's a built-in network so that immediately you already know someone who's going to tell you all kinds of wonderful things about how to be a successful UMHS student. So it isn't really academic. It's more of where can I get pizza? Uh, What's the cheapest flight that I can get? Um, you know, how can I get transportation? Where is the best access to the beach? You know, anything that's related to school and to being a successful student, quickly finding, you know, where the teaching assistant uh, sessions are happening and so forth. Um, And there are two aspects to the program. One is a mentor-mentee program, which is a traditional mentoring program, individualized. And then we also have a program that's called Power Up. And that is a session a uh, very good tip session uh, where a student who has done very well on a specific block exam shares their tips uh, to an individual or to a large group of students, letting them know how they can prepare for that block. And the two students that we have here this evening, Corinne and Ali have actually uh, conducted those. And Ali is, has been the mentor of the semester and he has had the highest attendance of those sessions as well. So it's a wonderful program. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Ali, do you want to do you want to say a little bit more about that? Sure. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Dr. Spurler, thank you very much. One of those greatest people that I want to tell everyone in our school and she needs to be really applauded is Dr. Sparza. Uh, when I met Dr. Sparza, it was when after three weeks of attending a medical school and how hard it was for me coming back to school and wanting to quit. And she tells me, I won't let you. And, you know, she got me so familiar with the school and with the program. And once I got the sense of that care that I received and Corinne is here, she can like, you know, attest to that. I'm not just saying that, but um, it was, it was very reassuring. And about the program of the mentoring program or the power up sessions, I personally enjoyed so much and I have benefited so much from um, being, actually being a mentee. Someone mentored me in the, my first semester, uh, first semester at school when I was taking my anatomy class or uh, my cell biology class. I really uh, benefited from that. So once I, earned that um, essential uh, information that I needed to uh, to pass my classes I would say I didn't do so well in my you know my first semester but what I did so well was after on and that just because I got the sense out of it I talked to the right people I got very uh, adjusted to the system I got adjusted to the island I I was one of the first ones when the COVID and then when the quarantine was uh, lifted, I moved to the, uh, the campus just to be there on my classes every day. So, and uh, the program has helped me a lot. So I felt the need to essentially to give back to people. And I actually get very satisfied and you become very happy and uh, um, get a sense of satisfaction when I see the help or the little information that I give to people uh, has become really helpful for them to achieve their goal. And that was one of my main things because I got the best mentor. So I tried to become a uh, good one for them. And I'm glad and I'm very humbled that I received that uh, award from Dr. Spars and from the mentoring program. And I got selected by that. So thank you. So, so one of the things, Marie, that, that, that I'm just going to emphasize again, you can provide a great academic program, a terrific curriculum, uh, good faculty, but if you don't have the support services and students struggle, it, 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 it's all for naught. So what's nice about this program, what I, what I think is great about this program is, is it, it's small school environment. It's that personalized education. It's that one-on-one -on -one with working with uh, Dr. Esparza and faculty members to ensure you're going to be successful and to help you in any way they possibly can, whether it, it, it be uh, emotional support, academic support, uh, or, or just general support in terms of, you know, how to, how to live on the island. It's all those little things that are really important because, you know, all of you who are on this, on this call right now, Medical school is intense. I'm just going to tell you, it's probably going to be the hardest thing that you've ever done in your entire life. And you have to be incredibly focused, know what you want to do and have a good routine. But you need that support group to help you uh, when you need that help. So we're here to help you. We want to make sure you make it through. And as I said before, 4% attrition rate is, is outstanding uh, for an institution. So it shows that we really care and we're dedicated to you. Great. Corinne, did you want to come on and, and say say something? I mean, uh, Ali really said all, all, almost all of it. <laughs> I mean, all of it, really, um, how great Dr. Esparza is. Like, since ARP, she's been my crutch, really. <laughs> Every time I ha need something or uh, even um, like when we uh, when I first came to the island, like she was there for that support and because when I came to the island, we were still kind of in the COVID restrictions and stuff. And she was always like, if you need anything, let me know. Like, it's um, definitely UMHS is, is a community. Like, everyone is helping everyone, um, not just, you know, faculty and professors, but your peers. Like, they, 
everyone wants to help everyone. Like I never feel like, like I'm in a competition because like, I feel like they, like my peers want me to be successful and I want my peers to be successful. So it's, it's a great community here. So <laughs> that's yeah. all I wanted to say. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. I think Dr. Esparza, we need to do a, a runoff webinar, uh, just really talking about student support and what it, what it takes to be a successful med student, because I think that that is just the, the most pertinent thing that's on everyone's um, mindset. So, yeah. Great. I also will uh, uh, say, Dr. Esparza, you're terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I did not pay them any money or buy them any cupcakes or anything to say that. Uh, but Thank you, honestly... President Ross. I, I, I'm heartwarmed. But like, you know, I'm really happy that you know that. And I'm, I'm, I'm really, I, you know, I'm speechless. When I met Dr. Esparza, the oh, best of the best out okay. there. <laughs> <laughs> let's just say that our students are wonderful president ross they we're, are just so inspiring and they're we're, wonderful we're all on her fan club <laughs> <laughs> good okay the, the next couple slides i'm just going to get through pretty quickly because they're pretty standard for for med schools i really want to get us into um, the clinical sciences residency and then we'll talk about admissions requirements um, there are some questions that are open here i'm still i still have it as we're going to answer them live but we're going to answer them further along in the presentation because they're going to make more sense uh, when we get to those slides but like most schools we do have a student government association our students are very active within uh, community service within saint kitts as well as back in puerto rico or uh, the united states States. Um, this here is a picture of a, a medical mission trip that our students went on. Uh, we were going to head over to uh, Ghana and uh, Western Africa, but COVID hit. So uh, we will be looking forward to returning back there and, and giving back in that magnitude. Um, and personally, it, it, it feels wonderful belonging to a university that, that that's doing this and that the students are so passionate and that they take their break between semesters, which is really only two or three weeks between semesters, and they use that time to go over and to uh, deliver as best medicine as they possibly can. Uh, here's just a picture of our students underneath the tent. The tent will make sense to you once you're a student because you'll be having your lunch down there and hanging out uh, with all of your friends and, and having some study groups outside. You will get used to the weather. I'll tell you that I'm an Irish gal and I got used to the weather down in, uh, in St. Kitts. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be perfectly fine. Um, we do like to encourage that you do take a couple hours every single week to close the books, unwind, as long as it's not block week, as long as it's not finals week. Um, we want you just to really go out there um, and just unwind and, you know, make sure that your mind is balanced. What's very important when you're going through medical school is that you're taking care of your mental health. And when you do see St. Kitts, there are, there's a plethora of things for you to do and everything is outdoors. So it's a wonderful balance and a great place. And most students will tell you that they've only seen the beach a handful of times, which is, you know, realistically all you should be seeing in med school, but there's plenty of opportunities for you uh, to go out and balance your time. During orientation week, President Ross um, does have a fantastic week for all of you to transition uh, to St. Kitts and transition to medical school studies. And right before classes starts, uh, he will take you on a catamaran trip or will host a beach party so that you can mix and mingle with faculty administration and fellow students. And President Ross will be walking around the beach meeting all of you. So that, that's very um, unusual for a president of a university to do, but President Ross is, is, is very hands on and I think that that speaks volumes in terms of the success of, of students here. There are plenty of conveniences in St. Kitts. When I'm down there, Ali, I saw your room. I think that's a Royal St. Kitts. I stay at the Royal St. Kitts. I do all my food shopping with the students as well. The prices might not be exactly the same that you'll find in Toronto or New York City or Miami. They might be a couple cents more, but it's not, it's not a drastic difference. But you'll find everything um, that you need that you usually get in the States. 
Um, this here, uh, these are just uh, little food huts that we have on campus. The upper left is our cafeteria. There's, they have a set menu, breakfast and lunch and dinner every single week. So you can go in and get food if you don't want to cook. Uh, we also have uh, a Latino food truck. We have uh, Rituals Coffee, which is like uh, Starbucks or a Dunkin' Donuts, if you will. And we also have uh, a bodega, bodega, um, in, throwing out New York terms there. We have a little grocery store in, inside our campus as well. So you can get everything um, that you need. Student housing averages about $900 a month, okay? And we have a housing database. So once you're an accepted student, you'll get the credentials to log in there. And there are listings of hundreds of available uh, places for you to choose from, from something that is maybe 500 US dollars a month, which is a small little studio to, uh, upwards of $2,000 a month. It's really that control is in your hand and really is dependent on how you like to live. Um, so you could really be on the lower end or the much higher end of that of that spectrum uh, there. Now, if I can have actually, Corinne, if you don't mind jumping back on and just talking a little bit about housing quickly, and then Ali, if you can give your opinion real quick and then uh, we'll move on. Thanks, Corinne, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. So actually, yeah, I've lived three different places here. <laughs> um, uh, so the first place I lived was the Marriott residences. And I would have to say the Marriott is a little bit pricier, but you get like all the amenities with it. So you get a gym, you get two pools, like there's a lot of things that go with that. And especially like the electricity is included. So you have to think about that as well. The second place I lived was St. Christopher Club. There's two places. So there's the club and then there's the gardens. The gardens is more updated. So if you're going to try to live in one of those, I would go to the gardens. Um, and I don't know if they have separate electricity, but when I was living in the club, it was separate electricity. And of course, it's not very updated. So we definitely spent a lot on electricity to keep the AC going because <laughs> um, it gets hot here. <laughs> and um, that is part of the reason why we moved to uh, the new place, um, Hillsboro Residences, um, which is right across from the school. And everything's like updated here. Uh, everything's brand new. So um, it's very nice and it's, I'd say in between, um, the price range is, range is in between the Marriott and the uh, St. Christopher Club Gardens. So, um, and uh, at Hillsboro Residences, you don't have to pay separate electricity, it's also included. So, um, so far, I haven't had to pay anything extra. I know I be, I think I've heard some people have to pay a little bit extra for electricity at the Marriott, but um, so far I really like it here. It's kind of secluded, but for me, uh, especially for the fifth semester, I needed to be somewhere where I could study <laughs> and not be distracted. So I definitely love it here, um, but those are, my opinions about the three places. The Marriott is very nice. Um, it's also not too loud either. Um, when I lived at the club, there was definitely a lot of uh, other residents uh, there too, like from Ross and then just random people. So it was definitely a lot louder there. So it, it depends on what your price range is. I know the Royal is also a good place. Um, to go. Uh, there's a lot of students that go there too, but everyone's studying there and there isn't like random people there too. So, um, and definitely cheaper than the Marriott. So um, those are my opinions <laughs> about those places. <laughs> one, one thing I'll add to that is that we have a substantial database of housing around the island. So you can get uh, places as close as across the street from the campus um, to as far away as Frigate Bay, which is is more of the uh, kind of the tourist area where you have a strip on the beach, which has all the restaurants and bars and that students populate uh, for, on Fridays and Saturday nights. 
um, to, you know, as I said, you know, Mat Matingly, which is right across the street. And, and so it's just, your, it, it's your choice. Our housing director, Carolyn Library, will, will show you around. She'll explain to you, you know, what the different locations are. But, you know, in, in many cases, it, it really depends upon what your budget is, how much you want to spend. Uh, and, and the database will show you what amenities are and an approximate location and the distance from campus. So uh, we actively work with our students to make sure that they find the accommodations that are best suited for their needs. Okay, great. And let me just uh, explain this map here. Um, this is just a map of St. Kitts. The airport is right in the middle. To the right over here is Frigate Bay, and I've kind of uh, extended the area a little bit larger, and that's where you'll see the Royal St. Kitts, the Marriott residences, and so on. Um, this area over here, the yellow is the school, and you'll see a lot of the housing facilities are actually within walking distance uh, to campus. Um, so I hope that I answered that there. That was a question that came in that you wanted me to point here. How long does it take to get from each area? So from the airport to campus, about 10 minutes. So from Frigate Bay over to campus, um, anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and Ali, can you just talk very quickly about the Royal St. Kitts and your experience uh, living there? That would be great. Thank you, Nick. Um, uh, it's actually funny. I, I, I don't live at uh, Royal St. Kitts. I am at the Royal St. Kitts right now because of a, of a friend of mine. Uh, I was having a little Wi-Fi issue. Uh, but actually, I can't say much about my experience of uh, living in different, uh, like at Marriott or St. Christopher or um, Royal Marriott, uh, just because I don't live there and I've never lived. I've I found actually my own uh, place that I live right now. I had a roommate that came from me from Chicago. And I actually you know, found it on Google through a regular search that we do as we do in the US. I, you know, I found the, the realtor and you know, the, I told my budget to the realtor, the realtor showed me different places and then I had an easy like, you know, um, access via Zoom or like via FaceTime with them. I looked at the places I told them virtually, and um, once I found a place that it was nice, I did my own research on it, and I, I, I found the place that I live right now, which is actually within the vicinity of the Frigate Bay, which um, almost where all the students live by, um, which is where like five minutes away, which in uh, St. for Marriott. But other than that, um, you know, I. This is this was my experience on. Great, thank you. One one of the questions Marie really asked about the is there any place you, you wouldn't want to live? So so the bottom line is that our housing department will not put people in places that are not safe. So they they are required to inspect uh, every facility. Uh, they know where it is. They will only put it up there on the database if it's safe, secure and it meets the highest of standards and the standards that we have uh, have produced. And for some reason, my screen looks very orange, so I have no idea why that is, but anyway. <laughs> Great. Thank you, President Ross. Okay, so now you're, you're finished. You're finished with the basic sciences. You're finished with living uh, in St. Kitts. So now everybody's gonna hop on a plane and move up to, to Portland, Maine. And we spoke about this briefly at the beginning. Uh, Portland, Maine is, is where you're gonna transition into the clinical sciences program. Um, it'll be a clinical immersion semester. Uh, clinical Medicine two and Board Review. And the Board Review, what that stands for is you're going to be reviewing for Step 1, and you're going to be re reviewing for Step 1 from Day 1. So the first day, you're, you're actually going to take the Kaplan Exit Exam, and then you're going to take it at the end of the semester. Uh, again, semesters are three and a half months long, and that's really just to, to, to gear how, how you've done. And we have numerous, we have AMBOSS, like we said, MBME and Kaplan Medicine, uh, all the tools that you need uh, to really focus on step one. You'll also have the opportunity to choose from a pretty large list of physicians within the vicinity of the Portland main campus that you will be able to shatter, shadow. 
So if you're interested in orthopedics, for example, uh, or pediatrics or neurology, you can pick one of those uh, practitioners and then you'll be able to go do rounds with them, to uh, learn how to do soap notes. That's something that's very important. So all of these small little skills uh, will mean the world to the person who's in charge of you when you're in your clinical rotations, because you're already going to be entering clinical rotations, knowing how to do all these small skills, such as soap note taking and so on. And you'll be able to really get that in-person uh, experience when you're, when you're up in Maine. And so it's a, it's a very, very strong program. Uh, Intro to clinical medicine school, uh, the, the semester, like I said before, soap note writing, preceptorship experience. This is where you're going to do your CPR training, ACLS training. Uh, and they'll also work with you to do your personalized study plans because at the end of the day, it's about passing step one so that you can move on to your clinical rotations. And as President Ross said before, AMBOSS, MBME, Kaplan Medical uh, will, will be right there for you so that uh, you can uh, make sure that you're passing that exam. Okay. After, okay, President Ross. Yeah, yeah, just let me just stop on this one. So what, what's really important about the, the Kaplan program, uh, and we made some changes this year. So in the past, the Kaplan review program was only six weeks long, uh, but it was very intense. It's eight hours a day uh, of lectures, five days a week. And we felt that we needed to decompress that uh, because it's really hard to absorb that much information over a six-week period of time. So we now have extended to a full 15-week program, uh, but we, we've made some modifications to it. Uh, USMLE Step 1 it, it, it includes a lot more clinical vignettes than, than in previous years. So we, we, we've extended this from a six-week six program to a 15-week program, uh, we've included a lot more clinical material um, and we've decompressed it. So it gives you a better opportunity to absorb the information uh, uh, over a 15 week period. Great. Thank you, President Ross. OK, so you have passed step one. Now it's time to move in to the clinical rotations. And as President Ross meant to, mentioned earlier, you're gonna be doing 48 weeks of core rotations. And that's gonna be done at our affiliated hospitals on, on this list here. Everything that you see on this presentation tonight, you have full access to on our website. So if you need to, to find a list of all this, you just hop under the clinical affiliation section of the website and all this will be there for you. So your third year is your core rotation year and uh, you'll be sent to do pediatrics, OBGYN, psychiatry, family medicine, internal medicine. I think I got them all. Surgery. I, don't, I think I said surgery already, but uh, you'll, you do have the ability to do all of your clinical rotations in the same state. You might not be able to do it at the exact same hospital, but you will have the opportunity to do them all at the same state, or you can move around. Um, and at this time, uh, it would actually be good if Dr. Workus, if you can come on and talk about your experience in the clinical rotations. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so clinical rotations is really exciting because now you're back in you know, a state um, that you potentially might wanna practice in and the school is really helpful um, getting you situated with a, ho with a hospital of your choice. Um, for me specifically, I knew I wanted to be in the Michigan area. So I did um, majority of my core rotations at McLaren Oakland Hospital in Pontiac. Um, and they do take a lot of UMHS students and that is definitely shown in their residency program. I think we had three emergency medicine residents going through that program at the same time. One of them being a chief uh, resident from our school. Um, and then I decided to go to Danbury, Connecticut for my psych rotation. This is a great um, experience for me. They had a good inpatient psych unit. Um, and UMHS has connections at all of these places for housing. Um, so it was very easy for me to be set up for the six weeks rotation that I did in Connecticut. Um, and then as far as electives, so after you do your core rotations, um, the following year you do electives. Um, I really wanted to work at St. John's Hospital, which is actually the hospital I'm an attending at now. 
Um, we didn't have any affiliations, but I um, had a, I knew someone who was an OBGYN doctor there and UMHS was really helpful working with him, getting me um, credentialed to do my rotation there. So um, it was really important for me to be at that specific hospital and just knowing that UMHS will, will help you every step of the way is really important. Thank you, Dr. Workus. And Dr. Zhang, would you mind coming on and talking a little bit about your experience in clinical rotations? Where did you do your cores and all that good stuff? Yeah, so I also, um, I think it's a different approach to clinical rotations where um, being from the New York, New Jersey area and having gone to undergrad in Georgia, um, I didn't have much of an issue kind of going up and down the East Coast to kind of get a better experience and uh, knowledge about each of um, different healthcare systems, exposure to different programs. And I think that level of face time was also really important. So I spent time in Georgia originally for general surgery, then went up to um, Baltimore where I spent a uh, majority of my time there, but then also went to um, into New York for uh, one of my rotations, um, also to Connecticut for my psychiatry rotation. So I was a bit all over um, the East Coast and that was by choice, not by uh, scheduling. Um, I really wanted, again, to be part of different programs that had active residencies. I wanted to be engaged with the programs and really just get a sense of, you know, uh, how do I stack up also compared to other students. Um, so it was really important to me that, you know, I was working alongside students from other offshore medical schools, but also from uh, domestic uh, students as well. So working with students from University of Maryland and from Hopkins, um, I think was a really eye-opening experience to just get a sense of, you know, where did my education stack up? And what I really found out was, so it's basically the same thing. And probably in some cases, um, whether it's by my own effort or by the education from the faculty, you know, uh, I felt much more prepared um, and capable. And I thought that was really uh, an eye-opening experience for me. And so I think that speaks to um, the quality of the rotations and just kind of the effort we put into vetting all the rotations and the faculty to make sure that, you know, the students that go there are going to get a, um, a legitimate experience and understanding of the specialty. And really from the rotations really set me up perfectly for me to make my decision where there wasn't much of a question that, yes, I want to do internal medicine and uh, really no question about me pursuing an academic career, which is what I'm in right now. Um, and so I think um, it's really important how much uh, work, you know, goes into selecting these. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely a huge credit to the faculty for, you know, vetting all this and really building a core um, administration to focus on this. And so my, my hope is that when this clinical clerkship list continues to expand, each of that continued, you know, excellence in each of the rotations is really just going to grow from that. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Um, and President Ross, before we move on, did you want to talk any more about clinical rotations? Sure. I was just typing uh, answers out to people. <laughs> Uh, but in any event, yeah, so 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 just it's really important to have everyone to understand that we're accredited by ACCM. ACCM is an accrediting body that's uh, located in, in, in Ireland. They've ad adopted the LCME standards of accreditation. LCME is the Liaison Committee of Medical Education. They actually accredit LCME accredits U.S. and Canadian medical schools. So by them adopting those standards, both as written and as applied, um, they're required to do a variety of things. As we, as I mentioned earlier, not only do they have to review the, basic, the entire basic science program, but on an annual basis, they're out visiting all our teaching hospitals to ensure that we meet their standards. So every one of our teaching hospitals, so these are hospitals that are affiliated with U.S. medical schools, has been reviewed and has been approved by, by our accreditors. And the ACCM is recognized by US Department of Education through NCFMEA, National, Council, National Committee on Foreign Medical Education and Accreditation. So um, I feel very good that the, in terms of the caliber and the quality of the training and the education you receive at every one of our hospitals, uh, it's on par with what you want at US schools. We are continuously looking to expand the clinical program uh, and, and we are in constant contact with hospitals and even our affiliated hospitals are looking to ways to expand the clinical program. So for example, last week, I was uh, on the phone with Ascension. Ascension is gonna be adding more core opportunities uh, and expanding what they already offer in the clinical program. Uh, we've had similar uh, com communications with Ponce recently, um, and we're just always looking to not only expand 
uh, in, within the framework of uh, our, our hospitals, but also to add additional hospitals. And that's just an ongoing uh, program. And as we add them, we keep our students fully informed. Great, and, and President Ross, we have a question that came in. This leads into the, the state approvals. Um, when will UMHS achieve accreditation uh, in New York? And we know that that's a process and COVID kind of put us back a little bit. Okay, so so we, so I, it's, it's a long-winded conversation. So uh, a long-winded answer. So understand what state approvals mean. So there's a handful of states that actually approve foreign medical schools for a variety of different reasons. So for example, Florida, uh, would, before you're, if you're not approved, you can do residencies there, but you couldn't do clinicals. Now that we're fully approved in, in Florida, our students have the opportunity to do both residencies and clinical rotations. And if you went back to that page earlier, you could see the number of hospitals that we currently have in Florida uh, that we're affiliated with. And once again, we're, we are already in discussions with other hospitals to expand that clinical program, as well as we're in, in uh, communication with other hospitals in Georgia to expand currently. So, so we are in discussions with other places to expand the, the clinical program. Um, then uh, California, it, it, if you were not approved, uh, you couldn't do clinical rotations there, you couldn't do residency there, uh, but you could be licensed there after you've been in practice for 10 years. They recently changed their regulations uh, probably a couple of years ago, which said that if, you're rec if your school is recognized by U.S. Department of Education through NCFM and your accreditation is recognized by NCFMEA, you're automatically approved in the state of California. As a result, our students are qualified for clinical rotations in that state, residencies in that state, and licensure in that state. And there's a look back of 10 years so that anyone who graduated in the prior 10 years, uh, and, and look at Billy Zhang is just saying he's licensed in California and New York. Uh, so there you go. Um, th then um, we're approved in Georgia and the approval in Georgia has just opened up a lot more clinical opportunities and we have a significant number of students who are doing residency. And one of the things that I didn't really mention is that Typically, where our students do their, their cores, they gravitate to, to doing their residency. So we have a large population of students doing uh, um, uh, residencies in Florida, uh, Michigan, uh, Illinois, uh, Puerto Rico, um, and, uh, and, and, and you can see from that map where, where our students are. So they're, they're very successful in, in their met residency match. Um, and they're getting some really, uh, and I urge you on our website, we, li we actually list where, where our students are going uh, and, and they're getting some of the hardest uh, residency opportunities in, in the, out there. So we're competing at a very high level um, in, in even uh, orthopedic surgery. So it's, uh, it's pretty outstanding. Uh, and the last but not least is New York. We have an application into New York. We're waiting for them to, to decide uh, when they're going to review us. Everything was on hold with them for the last two years due to the pandemic. But we, we expect that, that that's going to change now that things have, have improved. So we, we're ho hopeful that uh, we'll have a site visit in the near future. And the reason I like New York um, is, is right now, if you're not approved, you can do 12 weeks of rotations there. You can't do a residency there, but you can be licensed in New York State uh, upon graduate, uh, be licensed in New York State. But what New York has, that different from most other states, is that they have probably the most residency programs in the United States. So by getting approved in New York, it opens up a lot more residency opportunities for you. That, anything else, Marie? No, 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 that's fantastic. I actually uh, wanna bring on Dr. Workus. If you could talk a little bit about your residency experience 
Um, everyone, you'll see up here a little chart here. Yes, it's much more specialized on our website. This is really just breaking it down and giving you just a quick uh, summary of everything. But as President Ross said, you can hop on our website and you can just expand all of the years and you can see every single placement, the hospital and what specialty. Um, but uh, Dr. Workers, if you can just talk a little bit about your experience in residency, internal medicine, and, and how the whole ecosystem works, that would be great. Yep. Um, so this is always your number one priority when choosing a medical school. This is the number one question. You know, if I attend this medical school, will I match into residency? Um, they say if you have, I think when I was going through residency, the magic number was to have at least seven residency interviews to make you feel comfortable that you would match. Um, you know, a lot of my UMHS colleagues, we had up to 20 uh, interviews. Um, coming from the Caribbean, you do want to apply to a vast uh, majority of um, hospitals, um, but when, just because you're nervous, but then when you actually go through the process, we're getting tons of interviews everywhere. Um, I did my internal medicine residency in Chicago. If you see the list here by specialty, um, the bottom two, internal medicine and family medicine, have the longest bars, so most people match into these specialties. Um, but what's not said on here is, you know, you can be done with the internal medicine residency and be a hospitalist, and some people choose to do that, but majority of people, especially um, from my friend group and colleagues that I know, um, they go on to specialize, and that's called the fellowship, and that's extra training um, after your residency. I did my uh, fellowship in palliative care and hospice, um, but for internal medicine, these people can go on to do cardiac um, a bunch of different specialties, which isn't, you know, listed here. And I am part, I'm actually the vice president of the alumni group uh, for UMHS. And one of our goals is to, um, with a portal that we're creating is to be able to trace where our, you know, students have done fellowship. And I think that would be very interesting to see. Same thing with family medicine. People can go on and do fellowships in sports medicine and things like that. So while those two bars are the biggest, um, I guarantee that a lot of those people went on to do um, extra training and fellowships. Um, and then, uh, you know, in, uh, emergency medicine, that hospital I did my rotation at, uh, multiple UMHS students doing ER residencies there. So Whatever you're interested in, uh, if you do your clinical rotations and um, make a good name for yourself during you know, your third and fourth year, um, that really sets well when you're interviewing for residency um, and makes you stand out. That's excellent. And I, I knew that you were going to talk in detail about internal medicine, because one of the most asked questions is, what about the other specialties? And that's basically what internal medicine is for. And just to repeat what you said, some students will go on to be hospitalists, or they'll go on to do fellowships. They can do GI, um, just like uh, and you wanted to palliative care, Dr. Workus, and so on. And uh, Dr. Zan, oh, Go ahead, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ross, uh, President Ross. So Holly, uh, uh, tomorrow, give me a call. I want to give you some uh, recent stats, but we're, uh, we have people actively working on stats and we have a substantial number of people who have gone on for fellowship uh, opportunities after they complete their residency. So uh, I'd like to share that with you tomorrow. Awesome. And just to point out, you know, those aren't the only two that do fellowships. My two best girlfriends did anesthesia residency and they both did fellowship in um, pediatric anesthesia after their anesthesia training. So, uh, yeah, I'm very interested to hear uh, the data that we have so far. Great. And Dr. Zhang, what was your experience through residency? Yeah, I also had a, a similar experience too, where I actually trained in uh, Pennsylvania through a, a few different programs. And so I think um, the education, I think, was really important um, to really just set a good foundation just from a clinical perspective. I think there's always the learning curve about the electronic medical record and not being able to, you know, uh, understand that to begin with. So that did take a few months. But again, that's not a reflection of like necessarily the clinical rotation because you might not be putting in orders and doing, you know, uh, documentation within the record. But when it comes to seeing patients, seeing volume, talking through cases, looking at research, interacting with peers, residents, students, and attendings. I think uh, I really had gotten a really good experience from my rotations and just carried all that forward. So when I interacted with my future attendings, I mean, I think there was a little bit of anxiety about that, but um, from a knowledge perspective, it was, I felt very comfortable um, at least starting off as an intern and then building on that experience throughout the rest of my rotation. 
Um, one of my programs, the first I went to did close actually. Um, and so I did transfer to a different program where the majority of residents around me were from US based programs um, or from more uh, other well known programs abroad. So it was really interesting to kind of see how what I've learned kind of stacked up. And again, it was a very comparable experience. Um, and then just to piggyback on what Holly had mentioned too about kind of what happens in life after residency, um, you know, you can also add in, you know, going into academia, uh, administrative, graduate medical education. Um, and for me, I consider general medicine to be like my specialty. So I do inpatient, so hospitalist work, um, everything from emergency room admission to seeing admitted patients and discharge. And then also during the week, I see patients in the clinic several times um, in addition to supervising residents, medical students. Um, and so um, kind of I've transitioned a little bit of my work to academics and more um, resident focus. So again, there's so many ways that you can take um, your education and residency um, and life afterwards. You can see myself, Holly, um, and so many more of our students are in really diverse fields and uh, really you know, kind of putting our program on the map. Super, thank you so much, Dr. Zhang. And so we've come towards the end of the presentation here, and I'm just gonna go ahead and go over the admissions requirements uh, very briefly uh, with you, and I'll be able to answer some of the questions that were asked uh, throughout the presentation in the Q&A area here. So our application is completely online. You need a minimum of 90 undergraduate credits, but a lot of our students will have a bachelor's degree before they come in. Uh, the most important thing is you need to have the pre-med prerequisite courses completed, and that's, that's your general biologies, your general chemistry, your organic chemistries, physics, English, and math uh, courses as well. Two layers of recommendation. One should be from a science professor, unless you've been out of school for more than two years. A personal statement. Uh, we do review each student individually. We do not have a minimum MCAT or a minimum GPA score. We're really, We really want to know what your story is. Uh, and we'll be able to kind of peel the onion on why you want to do this for the rest of your life in your in your interview. So the online application, we actually use the same system as um, the allopathic and osteopathic schools use uh, in the United States. So this application might look quite familiar to you uh, when you go inside, but it's much more simplified in comparison to the allopathic and osteopathic applications. Uh, you just, when you log in, just make sure that you read everything carefully and you do not omit any information. Um, and you will be given a coordinator every step of the way. So if you have any questions, you'll always be able to reach somebody, whether that's on live chat um, or you can call in and somebody will always be there to pick up the phone. And the primary decisions that you will receive, you'll receive um, the acceptance into the standard med program. Remember we spoke about at the beginning, that's where the basic sciences is four semesters. Or you'll be accepted into the extended basic sciences where those four semesters are extended to five semesters. Or you might be offered to start in the accelerated review program. And we heard the success of it through Corinne earlier. Uh, or you might be denied. If you are denied, we will give you insight into why you were denied and we'll, we'll advise you on what you can do better to strengthen your application. Um, there's one question there, you know, What's the age category of students? We have students that come directly out of uh, university. We have career returners, students that have been out of school for five plus years, 10 plus years. We have students in their 30s, 40s, 50s, all categories. Um, you know, we have a lot of non-traditional students that, that have come to UMHS and been quite successful. And we've heard through uh, Dr. Esparza and, and what her department does as well, that we want to make sure that whatever student comes in, the first thing is you're placed into the correct program that you need to be in in order to be successful. And two, that you have the support, you know already to access to the, the support so you're not falling behind. Okay, now let's move on to the, the tuition and fees. So the tuition and fees here, um, I went on to basically everybody's website and I, I put this in an Excel sheet and added everything up and picked some of the, the, the schools that I thought um, met all the accreditations that you need and put this up here and then put us up in, in, in comparison. Um, 
we are not owned by investment companies or corporations. We are family owned and you heard President Ross speak about that earlier. So we have the ability to keep the full tuition on the lower end. So this is actually comparable to in-state tuition for a U.S. medical school. The conversions, the Canadian conversions, you'll, you'll see below there. This is uh, current as of June 27th. So we're about 170000 for the full four years, tuition and fees only. Um, and I want you to keep in mind that you know, there are pretty large scholarships out there at other universities, but what they don't tell you is it's still expensive at the end of the day. So if you receive $50,000 somewhere, that's probably not going to make a dent in your in your education. And I'm kind of, I'm not kind of, I'm very proud to belong to a school that has kept the tuition down and they're not in the business of, of increasing just because. President Ross? Yeah. So one of the things that's important to me is, you know, I've run alumni organizations before, and I, I know that it can really impact the quality of life for our graduates uh, and, and students. So, you know, if you're if you're half a million or $300,000 in debt, uh, I mean, that's, that's basically like a mortgage. And the amount of money that you make as a resident is is not substantial. You start making money after you finish your residency program, but you still got to pay this back. And it becomes quite a burden if you have, you know, 300, 400, 500 thousand dollars of debt. And I take that into consideration because, you know, I want you guys to have a good lifestyle. So, you know, I purposefully have tried to keep the, our, our tuition down so that it's affordable. And that when you graduate, you're not overly burdened by such insignificant debt. So, you know, keep that in mind. I know that you're, you're everybody on this call is looking at, you know, a variety of alternatives. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, think about that debt load because it, it, it really will impact you. And the next question you're probably going to ask yourself is how do you... Uh, finance this. So we do have Sally Mae loans, which are available for the Accelerated Review Program, Extended Basic Sciences, and the MED Program. Our Canadian students are eligible for lines of credit through their, their local uh, banks, institutions there, and we do have institutional loans for those who qualify. And if I can't have all of the panelists, go ahead and turn on your, your cameras because we're just, we're finishing up here. And I just want to do a, a quick summary of, of our value. Um, high academic standards, personalized education. You heard it from every everyone here. From the moment you step in, you're going to, or the moment you pick up the phone and call us, you're going to have a friendly voice behind there that's going to realistically guide you the proper way. Uh, and that's very, very important to us um, that, that you're treated with that genuine respect from the get-go. Dedicated faculty, you heard from, from two here tonight. Uh, we have a fantastic campus. We have plenty of clinical sites for you, and that's growing. 94% uh, pass rate on step two which an average, with an average score of 231. That's vital information because that's going to help you attain your residency spots at the end of the day. Um, and we're also a very service and community centered school. So we wanna make sure that the students that are coming in, uh, that you're doing this for all the right reasons and that you're gonna go back into your communities and provide the, the, the standard of care that everyone should be receiving. So we're very proud of that. So with that said, uh, I'd like to just go around the room and if you have any last comments that, that you would like to make and what I'll do is, I'll, is I'm gonna put up some pictures of where you guys will be graduating. Um, once uh, everyone is speaking. So uh, Dr. Zhang, if I can just start with you, if you can just give any, any, any last, uh, last words. Yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, the information has all been really uh, well said about kind of our program in a nutshell. Um, and I, this is kind of what I talk to students about in interviews too, just kind of touching on the things that really make our program unique. And um, again, what was there a few years ago is, has been pretty much remodeled and upgraded. Uh, and so, there's so much more that students are coming into, especially from what's offered academically, but also extracurricularly. And so um, now is such a great time to be a part of our program when there's um, so much more being invested and constantly changing. And I'm not sure if President Ross mentioned the bridge too early, which I think you know is really important because I wasn't there when I was there. So um, again, there's just so much great, so many great things. Um, 
it's a fun place to be. It's a very collegial environment. Um, and for me, like I was very well supported kind of start to finish. And even now having this opportunity to, you know, keep in touch with administration, previous students, um, alumni who are across the country. Um, so there's just so many great things that I think really represent our program and are very distinct from other offshore schools and maybe uh, schools across the globe too. Um, and so there's um, so many great things I can say about it. And so um, if that's something that really, if, if that's what interests you as a student, um, then I would highly recommend at least, you know, submitting an application and just hearing us a little bit more and having a separate kind of conversation with us. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Zhang. Corinne, how about yourself? Yes, I mean, everything said tonight definitely encompasses UMHS, like from ARP all the way to when you go to residency. It's great to see doctors here that have made it all the way there. Like that tells you this is a successful program. Um, I mean, just, you know, one, one piece of advice that I've definitely try to keep to myself as well is that um, if you do choose this program, it's definitely a very unique program um, and that is to stay humble to yourself. Um, I know uh, a lot a lot of the time like you are hard on yourself with studying and all that kind of stuff. So really staying humble to yourself and knowing yourself and asking for help as well. Um, and you get that help from here. So um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. Ali, how about yourself? Oh, did we lose Ali? Oh, no, there you are. Okay. Sorry, um, No, I think everyone has, has been said. Um, one thing that I really find amazing uh, at school was that. Ali, can you get closer to the microphone? We, it's hard to hear you. One second, sorry. Can you guys hear me better now? A little bit, yeah. Okay. Uh, give me one second. Let me fix this, and then maybe somewhere else. Okay, sure, sure. Up. That's okay. I'll I'll come over. Dr. Sparza, how about yourself? Yeah, I just want to emphasize um, how wonderful it is to be at a small school um, because of the personalized attention and. I cannot say enough about the resources that our students have. Amboss, our library is Access Medicine, Kaplan. We just have so many resources for our students and the support. Um, and the faculty, um, just very quickly, I'll mention, and Dr. Katanch is here. I was reading a book, <laughs> Far From the Tree, and there was his name on page 108. <laughs> <laughs> talking about the research that he had done. So I ran over to his office and had him autograph it. So we have amazing <laughs> faculty. <laughs> Great, thank you. Dr. Katanj, how about yourself? Well, I think, you know, I understand one of the things that I like about this school and I like about teaching is that we want you to succeed. Um, I, over the years, have learned what a transition it is, no matter how smart you are, uh, when you hit medical school, there's an unending amount of material that you need to learn. And if you don't get some kind of leadership and direction, you can flounder. So I'm very, I'm very committed to making sure that you do not only well, but do exceptionally well at learning what you need to learn to, to pass exams that are, that are important for you as a physician. Um, and I just, I do, I, I admit, I had came from schools where we had 400 to 800 students and I was very proud that last semester, I knew every student by name um, and knew about them and their family stories. And I'm almost there this semester with a few more students, but it's really nice to walk around campus and have everybody say hi to you and you know, thank you for what you've done to them and tell them how what they learned has made them uh, successful at the later stages. It's, it's a really wonderful place to be. Great. Dr. Workis? Yeah. Um... So I was just thinking I to all these prospective students out there, I was in your shoes about 10 years ago. Um, I would 100% go to UMHS again. Professionally, I'm exactly uh, in the best dream job that I could have imagined. My advice to you would just get started. It's a long process and a long journey, um, but I think UMHS will give you all the tools that you'll need to succeed. 
Excellent. And President Ross, I'll have you close us out. So I'm hoping that, that, that everybody by now has a really good feel for who we are and what we're all about, what our goals are, our objectives, and what we're trying to accomplish. That not to reiterate everything that, that everybody said, but you know, bottom line is we care. I mean, we care about you. We care about your success. We want you to be doctors. We want you to be the best doctor you potentially can be. We provide the resources, the people, the faculty, the facilities. We understand, uh, you know, the clinical programs and all the uh, the nuances of accreditation. We we do everything that I think is right that you need to do as, as an institution to ensure your success academically from the faculty, the caliber and the quality of the faculty to the learning resources, to the specialists that will help you through the program, to that small intimate relationship that we have at our institution. I mean, the bottom line is we care, we care about you, we want you to be successful. And that's what I think we stand for as an institution. And we provide everything that you need to be successful, so I hope that you you know, consider us a, as a as a medical school in the future. And and if you do, and if you if you you apply and you come down, I will I will personally meet you not only on campus because I'm going to give you a personal tour, but at the same time I'm going to meet you at at, at my president's uh, 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 bash that we have for all incoming students the first week. And we get to meet, get to, I get an opportunity to, to hang out with you and get to know you on a personal level. So I hope that you choose UMHS as a, as a, a future medical school. Great. Thank you, President Ross. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I know we have some runoff questions here. So I'm just going to leave this up here for a few minutes. Our panelists, thank you so much for joining us. You're, you're more than welcome to go ahead and jump off. Dr. Esparza, we're going to do a runoff webinar. Uh, talking about talking about your your program again. Thank you all for your time. Uh, if you have any questions that were not answered tonight, please take your phone and put the camera on the QR code and go ahead and shoot me an email, and I would be happy to um, advise you on your personal uh, situation there. I think we have a couple transfer students that were on tonight. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And Ryan, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and 